Okay, uh, hi everyone. My name is Hui. Uh, I'm actually from working in New York right now for a company called Bloomberg and just visiting the city. Andrew actually was very nice to uh, let me stand in and give the talk today. Uh, so, hello. Um, the talk I'm going to do today is about building, testing, and deploying uh, images in the cloud. Um, that the, we, our, our team went through a lot of pains uh, building this CISD pipeline. So just uh, uh, at the end of the talk, I actually gave a sample of the code and configs and the Chef Cookbooks Terraform templates. Um, those kind of things that, that we went through uh, extracted out and, and you guys can feel free to use it uh, under Apache licenses to uh, uh, kind of build your own CI CD pipeline for building machine images. And it's actually not just for ma machine images. The technology that center in this pipeline is HashiCorp Hiker. And it can target, uh, it can target Docker images. It can target ma images in your private cloud if you're using OpenStack. Uh, it can target multiple clouds, uh, Google Cloud, Amazon, uh, Microsoft. So uh, pretty much cover all the flavors. It also cover uh, VMware. So pretty much cover all the flavors of images uh, that you want to build. So a little bit about the background, about the problems that we had at the time. Um, so like most people, we start out building what's called a Go AMI. Uh, which is, you know, the, the baseline, the most common denominator image that applies to all the application stacks that we have. And then at runtime, we will refactor on top of it using Chef cookbooks that install whatever is specific for that application stack, whether it's, you know, if it's a LAMP stack, it will be uh, you know, Apache, MySQL, whether it's Hadoop, and then we'll install Hadoop packages and put in the configs, and, and whether it's something else, not, you know, a, a typical node application. Um, but then we find it quite hard to build an image that fits everyone. Uh, and it started diverge very quickly with all the teams, uh, hundreds or so teams that we support, kind of funnel in with requests saying, saying, you know, I need this in the base image and I need that in the base image. Um, so we quickly realized that that process doesn't work one size and fits all for all these teams. So we say that each of these applications like, should have their own image. Um, but in order to maintain it, you don't want to be maintained by hand, and you don't want to uh, really build things by hand. And, and programmers definitely don't like to, to do things by hand. So uh, we start looking at uh, uh, what's called immutable infrastructure, uh, uh, kind of a, a new thing people talk about these days, which is um, you know you, for your application stack, everything should be built and tested and, and run. At, at runtime, nothing should change. So if you, you build something and you run with it, if you want to introduce a new change to your uh, production environment, you would build another image and you would go through your testing and your deployment pipeline uh, to gradually roll that image out to production. You don't actually you don't introduce that image to uh, a real-time production environment, whether through, through you know, a chef cookbook, through a, a uh, uh, Ansible playbook, or you know, just going on and run some commands, uh, and the really the the goals of uh, this approach is to keep uh, everything at constant, everything that needs to be uh, running at all time at constant. So, let's say you have a, a scaling event and and your uh, load increase and, and you need to spin up more instances to handle that load, your new machine should not have to depend on an external factor like a chef server or a Red Hat uh, registration server in order to spin up and handle that load. Everything should already be backed in. You shouldn't have to wait for installing MySQL packages or some other you know, giant Hadoop packages in order to handle the new loads. You want that to be back into the image so that the new machines can start accepting traffic as soon as possible. Uh, and you know that that image worked because you have been running with it with all the configs that is uh, baked in into the image. So that really the big one big plus of immutable infrastructure. Um, with that, 
you'll be able to do blue green deployment. You would be able to maintain uh, one image per stack, and you won't have to worry about the uh, external factors like you know the registration servers or or some other server that you reach out during uh, bootstrap time. So we we were a big fan of that approach, uh, and the technology that we started looking at is HashiCorp Packer, which is um, another tool. HashiCorp, if you don't know, is, is a company that brought a uh, popular development tool like Vagrant and Terraform and Consul, uh, the, same, the same company. And they put out Packer to build machine images. And, and it can target um, a lot of platform. Um, I think I have a Packer documentation here. Um, it targets EC2, it targeted uh, machine in digital oceans, Docker images, Google images, OpenStack, VMware, uh, Azure. And um, so, so we want to start out at the base using this technology. Uh, but we don't, but, but, but Packer, Packer, Packer templates, we don't want to be uh, just modifying by hand and somebody's home folder uh, have it and, and that person leave the company and it's no longer uh, control. Or like if multiple wanna contribute to the same, um, the same template, you don't want to be introduced uh, unknown changes in, in the template. So we want to check in the Packer templates into GitHub. But you don't wanna build those templates by hand either. So we introduced Jenkins in the middle of GitHub and Packer. And more than that, you don't want to build the Packer temp the machine images just by running shell scripts or just by copying files over. So we want to actually uh, introduce more codes into the process by factoring in the configurations and, uh, and, and the making of the images using Chef Cookbook. So take that part separate out from the provisioning of the machine images uh, that Packer does. And lastly, you don't want the, your machine image to just run, build, and push out to production. So we want to be able to introduce tests into them. And the framework that we use is server spec, which is uh, which is same as Ruby spec, R spec, if you guys have used it for Ruby on Rails. Uh, but it's, it's run tests for, uh, for servers, so it, it, it does things like uh, checking on directory uh, uh, and file permissions, uh, check if packages are installed, check if uh, certain users uh, and directory uh, and, and groups are created with, with uh, correct uh, uh, ownerships, those kind of things. So that's our, pretty much our, our pipeline uh, in a nutshell. So let's start out with the what a what a Packer image, uh, what, what a Packer template looks like. So it, it looks like a JSON document because it builds on top of it builds using HashiCorp proprietary domain specific language called uh, HCL, HashiCorp configuration language, and that is on top built on top of JSON. So it's fully JSON compliant and it's, it's, it's quite descriptive. You declare, you abstract everything out in variables up front, uh, things that you're going to reference within the section of builders below. Builders are basically the meat of the templates. That's where you specify things like where you want to build an EC2 image or you want to build a Google image. And, um, and then there's, there are more to it, like you can do provisioners, which are part that you want to happen to the image after the image is spun up. Uh, let's say the image is spun up in EC2, you want to uh, do a remote shell to run some shell command in that image. Or you want to upload a file, like a configuration file to that image. Uh, you want to run your Ansible playbook. In our case, specifically, we want to run a chef cookbook in that image. So we use the uh, chef client provisioner with our uh, packer template. Um, oh, uh, and also, um, nice thing about Piper is that after it builds the image, it can continue on with the build process, which is like you could push it, whether it's Docker image, you could push it to uh, your own private uh, registry, 
is like Artifactory or the public registry, uh, Google Container Registry or something like that. Um, with EC2, you can you can push it uh, directly to your Amazon account. You can have it copy to multiple regions in your Amazon account automatically, or if you have multiple accounts, you can have it uh, copy to multiple accounts using uh, AWS CLI commands. So that's quite nice. <clears throat> so for our pipeline, most everything happened with uh, a pull request open. So something like this. So somebody look at the, the, the packet template that I just showed you guys saying that I want to add something, I want to install a new package, or I want to do something. So they do a pull request to, to master. Um, one of the admin would come in and say, put in a comment in the pull request validate template. And, and this, this, is, this is an example, but you could have this step uh, automatically kicked off whenever a pull request is introduced to the repo as well. So validate template, and that uh, kick off a Jenkins job that does some unit testing. Basically, what behind the scenes does is we run Piker validate uh, and then the, the the template file. So if it, it, it passes for some syntax, uh, some syntax checks. So that's that's our unit testing. Um, then the admin say, okay, uh, if the unit test passed, the syntax looks correct. Let's build it in depth. So he'll comment, put a comment in the, in the same pull request, OK, to build in that. Um, and he never has to leave this pull request, by the way. Everything happened behind the scene. Uh, it will automatically trigger a Jenkins job. You see here, it will be in a running state, packet build, uh, pack build started. And that process takes roughly a couple of minutes to run through the Piker template, spin up an EC2 instance, and then download the chef cookbooks and run the chef cookbooks in on that instance, snapshot the instance, and do whatever you want to do, copy it to multiple regions, copy it to multiple accounts, right? But in this case, in dev, you probably just want to do in your dev account in one region, just for just for, for, for to see the build pass first. So that's 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 what happened behind the scene. The Jenkins job with one, and I just output the, the console output for you guys to see. A uh, couple of steps, like I'm not sure people can actually read. Uh, it will clone the, the, the Piker template, it will uh, run Piker build, uh, and then these are the kind of output that Piker does. So, so that's, that's, that's the part of the template that actually um, does the chef cookbook running. Um, you see, it, what we do here is what I have is I uh, uh, in the example I have is I copy the chef validator key from my uh, encrypted S3 bucket over, and then I run a little shell script to install chef client uh, using and enroll to the chef server using that validator key. And then I copy my server specs, which contain all my tests, into the image. Then I actually use the provisioner called chef client native to Piker to run the chef cookbook uh, with a run list. This is actually a variable. So I will pass in a run list. I will pass in all the uh, parameters needed for uh, enrolling with chef server. And this will take care of everything else. It will actually, I actually forgot. It's actually installed a chef client for you. I didn't have to install it myself. So it actually go to Chef and install that one line of Bash script to install uh, to get Chef server on. Um, then this step mm -hmm. is the critical step, which is after I run my Chef cookbook, which theoretically configure my image exactly to spec for that application stack. Then I want to run all my tests, which is uh, which is all my server server spec tests here. And if this step fails, which means that one or more, my test fails. The whole process will be rolled back. The images will be deregistered de from EC2 and eventually uh, disappear. Um, and then the Jenkins job, uh, the Jenkins jobs will fail. Something like this. So it, it will post into the pull request. Say, okay, if I could build fail, and then somebody will have to go and take a look at the output and see why it fails. Are we talking in production environment now? 
Oh no, we're still talking doing in depth. Yeah. So this is the part uh, where Piker call uh, run the server spec test, and, and and this is what I put here is a sample what a server spec test looks like. So in this one, it's very you know, very simplistic example. It says that uh, Apache should be installed, and Apache should be enabled and running on the machine. That's all it is. But you could introduce uh, a lot of tests. Um, in fact, in, for our production environment, I think we have roughly 30 some tests uh, for in, in our service spec. So this is what happened when you run. Uh, so when Piker run with, with uh, the build with service spec, you see that the step at the end there we're done with chef client, remove the chef client. Then it runs the service spec test and it say it says three examples, zero failures. So all the tests pass. And then if all the tests pass, it continue with the with the creating the AMI, waiting for the AMI to be ready. And then do other things that post processing that you want to do on, on the AMI. So this is actually an example of uh, our actual server spec, uh, you see there's about 31 tests running, things like the code deploy agent should be, uh, should be disabled because we don't want uh, the auto scaling group to deploy things to the instance before the, uh, it's actually uh, ready. Um, things like AWS Cloud Watch agent should be installed and exist. Uh, NTP to sync up the cloud. So we have, every time that we run into a situation with our image or with our application stack that is not covered by this test, we would go back in and add the test in via pull request. And, so, and the, the, the whole process repeats the same. Somebody re review the new test and do the test build and then eventually roll out the image to production and you know, theoretically you, you'll be covered for the next time. That case happens. So if if your build in depth succeed, it will post a comment to the uh, pull request. And if all if that's it's okay, you go to your dev account, you would see something <coughs> like this in your AMI screen, a new build. Uh, I I have it name and name tag with the time stamp, but you could have and. You could have named it, name anything. You could have it, have a naming convention for it. I also have uh, apply a tag of Python true. I find it useful because sometimes when you have both manual built and Python builds, you want to know uh, what image is built by what. So this tag actually quite quite helpful. Um, also the source AMI. Uh, you know, you want to tag that in case you want to trace back to the AMI, the base AMI that you build from, because not every time that you build from the, the, the base CentOS or you want to AMI, you could have build on top of build on top of build, so uh, that also is helpful. <clears throat> so this is the CD part of the pipeline. Uh, an admin, upon satisfaction build in dev, would go in and type promote image, and uh, theoretically it's behind the scene would trick up another Jenkins uh, job. And whatever this Jenkins job to do the promotion is up to you. Uh, whether all it is is copying out to all your production and staging accounts and leave it there, uh, you could do that. Or if you want to, you could have it automatically uh, update all the auto launch configs in your uh, auto scaling group so that the next instant that is spun up takes in the new, uh, the new image. Um, in my opinion, it's kind of risky that way because you don't know when the scaling events would happen. So uh, uh, you might want to leave it up to the application team to control how, they, how they're how deploying it, when they delete the instances to pick up the new, uh, the new MI. And then the pull request will be automatically merged and closed into master. OK. So if my internet works well, I could do a little demo uh, of this actual pipeline. So what I have here is a repo with uh, 
packet template for building a Ubuntu 14 image, a bunch of tests in server scope. Uh, so I want to pretend like I'm a developer going in and modifying, introducing a new change to the image, something like that. I would not break out into a template. Then I do a pull request against master. OK. So this pull request is now here. Um, I have another screen here I'm going to mimic to be the screen of an admin or somebody with privileged access to the repo. Go in, see a new pull request notification in the inbox. Uh, type validate template. And right away, it should uh, trigger the Jenkins job to validate the template. And if you want to follow what it does, uh, there's a little details button here that you could use to see. It's actually lead you to the Jenkins job that was triggered, and you can see the output of it. So in this case, it just basically run, uh, run this command, packet validate, packet five. And it says syntactically it's correct, so template validated successfully. Um, so then now it applies that and say, okay, unit test passed. Right. So then the admin will go in and say, uh, okay, to build in that. So that trigger another Jenkins job to build this actual this template. Um, the build process takes roughly about six minutes. Uh, you probably uh, want to follow along once this. So we'd say pack of build and then it first clone the, the template with pack of build and pack of does whatever pack of does, right? It, uh, it's, it's creating, uh, behind the scene, it's actually creating a temporary key pair to uh, SSH into the instance. It creates the instance, it SSH into it using this temporary key pair and then it runs whatever you tell it to run, in this case, we tell it to run chef client. So it, it does chef client, uh, it does an app get update, I, I assume right now, that's what it does. Um, so okay, this process is gonna run six minutes or so, so I'm gonna uh, go back to presentation. Um, the, <clears throat> the the sample configs and chef cookbooks and things that I that I did for this uh, demo, I put it up in this GitHub repo. So you guys could feel free to go there and try to uh, run the same. I put a little readme here for you to go through um, if you want to build the same the same pipeline. So we start out with run, running the uh, chef cookbook. Actually, it's, actually, it started out with running Terraform. Terraform would, would actually build the instances in an auto scaling group, the Jenkins instances in an auto scaling group, and it would run the Chef cookbook to configure the uh, OneNote Jenkins cluster for you with the sample packet, packet build, packet test, packet promote jobs. Basically, everything that, that happened in this demo. Um, so we have a cookbook. So this Jenkins wrapper cookbook is the one that, that set up Jenkins. Uh, you want to build cookbook. It's a sample cookbook that I, that I use in the Python template to build the Ubuntu instances. It does nothing more than just, I think, install Apache. Um, there's the Python template. So the actual packer, packer file here, it, uh, it targeted Amazon, um, and 
it trying to run uh, restricted to uh, Chef and run the Chef cookbook for you want to build people, right? So that's the one that, yeah. Uh, could you explain the advantages of using the, the child's syntax rather than just building automatically when the pull request is created and then closing it like a one game or that way? Yeah, so I mean, if you're really confident about your testing, uh, the test place, you can actually do that push on green deployment. Everything is automated, no admins is involved. Uh, I think we still have some with it controlled by a human factor because we're still building this out. So we, as we build this out, we don't know if the test is going to cover everything yet. So uh, I think if I, uh, right now the unit tests are done automatically. Uh, the build in dev is done by a human, and the promotion is definitely still uh, that controlled by a human factor. Um, I think eventually all of that will be automatically done uh, upon a, a pull request. But you also want to not do it on every pull request also because it could be just a, a, a comment change or something minor. You might want to bundle a bunch of pull requests into a bunch of commits into a release and kick, a, kick it off that way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the packet template. Um, the Terraform. Templates that there's a couple of Terraform templates that set this up. Uh, it set up uh, an ELB in front of an auto scaling group. It set up Jenkins inside an auto scaling group. Um, so it looks like it's like that. Uh, it set up all the security groups needed for Jenkins to access. It set up this particular security group needed for Piker to to do the uh, the creation of the instances and creation of key pairs and things like that. Um, there's a thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so I think I think that's all that's needed for you to reproduce the process and to see if the job is actually done. So. Good job. Okay. Maybe. Okay, actually it's done. So if it's done, I should go here and see that there's an image. Maybe it's not done yet. Okay, I see. I'm able to correct. Yeah. So this is a failure here. So it's a so Piper deletes some detects some errors, and and that's why it it rolled back and then no AMI was created. But if it was successful, you will see an AMI in there. And the demo will be a little bit better. <laughs> and then, and then theoretically, that that became successful, and uh, the admin would say promote image. And this really does nothing because I just have it. Uh, I'll put something and then, and then merge the commit. So as you see, the commits merge into master, and then the pull request close. That's, that's pretty much our CI CD pipeline. It's a, it's a Jenkins plugin called uh, GitHub Pull Request Builder, actually. Yeah. Uh, you, can, you can give it a bunch of phrases that will Yeah, you can give it basically any trigger phrase, uh, you know, Bumblebee, whatever. <laughs> uh, you, uh, 
you could have it uh, uh, do a bunch of things like only builds on success or something like that. Uh, uh, you have you can whitelist who could be admins who could who could type those phrase and trigger the build. Um, Uh, have you any way to make, I know you use an immutable approach, any way to handle in real time environment regarding the data side, like get a database or something like that in the CI deployment? Yeah, I think uh, mostly, uh, most of our applications stack uh, 12 factors, so they not, they, they, I would say immutable uh, infrastructure is more, applicable to 12-factor ap uh, applications than something like a monolithic uh, uh, stack. So it's, it's definitely not a solution for everyone. <clears throat> yeah? So I'm, I'm a little um, not clear on what the promote to prod process was. Can you just run through that again? Yeah. So this, the, the CD, uh, the promotion, which is the, the, the deployment part of the demo, is a little light because it's actually in, the, in production, it actually involves a lot of steps. Um, in, in our case, we, when we type promote image, you will actually copy to a bunch of accounts that we have staging accounts and production accounts. It will notify the owners. It will, depends on, on the application stack, it could apply, it could. Uh, change the auto scaling groups, auto, uh, uh, the launch config for that auto scaling group to use the new AMI ID right away. So yeah, it, it depends on, on what is needed for your environment. In theoretically, it's just a Jenkins job, so you could put in anything that you want to. Yeah. Uh, what impact do you have in the promote from stage to production, and at the same time you want to maintain consistency and constancy? Uh, you mean like if, when we promote from stage to production? Yeah, you want it to be constant, you want it to be consistency, and, and how do you manage that? And what impact you have in production? Yeah, so that's <clears throat> so that's that's a good question. It comes into the configuration part of the image. So um, when what, what you notice is when you build in depth, right? And you run the chef cookbooks, which theoretically pull in the configurations. That shouldn't be that configuration is specific to environments. So how do you abstract that out from from uh, from something that is built in dev, but doesn't have the production configurations in it already, and it's testable in dev and in staging. So that's a that's a. There are multiple ways to fix to to uh, deal with that problems. One is uh, you could build multiple images, and you have different tests for for each environment, specific each environment. Or if the configurations are really um, something that you want to keep outside of, of, of your builds, uh, because configuration applying on top of an image doesn't take that long versus installing packages or or pulling in data. So you would want to do that uh, at one time during uh, when you promote from staging to production. So yeah, it's just different ways. Yep. Uh, I saw you briefly mentioned the uh, Spring Rules what is just the new rules in production. So I'm just wondering how to manage the migration. You mean for database? Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so if if you want to run a, a database stack and do blue green deployment, you mean? Yeah. Um, I would say your images should not contain the 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 actual data. So in our case, sometimes we run. Um, uh, like a, a, a data store cluster, uh, and we actually store the data on um, some share some share storage, and the image is just containing runtime binaries. So in that case, you could do blue green deployment 
without having to worry about syncing up the data. But uh, in other case, like. Uh, for blue-green deployment? Yeah. No, blue-green deployment, you would actually have uh, uh, a totally separate st stack that handle the request. So uh, let's say your green, your green stack right now is handling all the active production requests, and you want to introduce a blue stack that have a you know, version 2.0 of your software. Uh, you would have that start stood up, but then gradually direct you know, 1, 2 percent, 10 percent of your traffic over to that stack. And then slowly, when 100 percent goes to that side, then you can retire your green stack. Yeah. Yeah. You have, sorry, you have the same data for connecting to one? You could. Uh, that uh, depends on, on really on, on application. There's some application that could do uh, a sharding, and you could store multiple replicas of the data on each individual. Uh, uh, instance, uh, then you can rely on that technology to sync up the shards uh, among the cluster. But if if it's the technology uh, like MySQL, for example, that needs a, a, a persistent storage backend that is not uh, that is not uh, shardable, then you have to um, you have to basically use a, a shared storage storage solution. Okay. So, do we have any more questions out there? Great, please join me in thanking Cody.